Three, two, <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, my, my. Welcome to the Red Eye Podcast. We are here. It is, uh, I don't even know what today is. Today, I feel like this week has been going by just super crazy. I'm already talking too much. We got a special <laughs> guest in the building. Who do we got today? Cam Burrell, um, professional track and field athlete for both Nike and Red Bull. I'm in the building. Glad to, he- glad to be here, too. Hey, air, air horns for Cam, man. <laughs> it, it's been a long time coming. Since I started this podcast, I always wanted to get Cam on here just because, like, I don't know. To me, you, are, you have that Kobe mentality or that Mamba mentality, at, at least when I think about, um, you know, kind of you as a person. And being, you know, on your team at U of H or us being on a part of the same team, um, being able to kind of just, um, you know, be in the same uh, kind of in- environment. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think about Cameron Burrell and they don't know you particularly, they may get a different idea about who you are as a person and kind of where your mindset is. But being around you all the time, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, it, it makes you want to be better as a person because you see someone who works truly hard. Exactly. So um, thank you so much for being here, man. You know, it's... Of course, anytime. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's crazy because, you know, thinking about where we've started and, you know, our families have been linked together through, you know, track and field, um, essentially. Um, if you guys don't know, like Cam said, he's a professional track and field athlete right now. Um, my dad was actually um, one of the fastest men in the world way back when in like the 80s. And his dad was actually sure was. one of the fastest men in the world. Both both guys were actually uh, world record holders in the 100 meter dash. So at different points of their lives, the fastest men in the world. So naturally, you know, when they have sons that are the same age, you would think that there would be some kind of competitive nature, you know, between us. But I think we were just competitive within ourselves and competitive in general. And, you know, the fact that we did go to the same college and we did grow up with each other, there was always been like a sense of brotherhood and, and love. So, um, again, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you for, for coming yeah, through. No problem. No problem. I'm super happy to be here. Um, yeah, you made actually um, an interesting point, you know, saying I do think have, I did get that sense of um, brothership or, you know, a family feeling from, you know, my family to yours growing up essentially in the same community, both from uh, Missouri City, uh, went to kind of rival high schools and, you know, ended up at the same university. You know, of course, kept our um, family traditions, you know, alive in one sense or another by being second generation Cougars and um, thing of that, things of that and track and field athletes of that nature. And so, you know, it's it, it's been great. It's been a great ride, a great experience thus far. Um, we're really just getting started, honestly, and um, we have a lot um, more wonderful things that we want to do and accomplish later on down, down the line. Um, super big year coming up with yep. the um, Olympics next year and um um, even with the COVID postponement, you know what I'm saying? We still have like big plans to, you know, take this thing as far as we, you know, we possibly can. Um, going back to the, uh, your point about like a uh, Kobe and then said, I appreciate the comments, but it's like, I'm not exactly as sharp as him, but you know what I'm saying? But I do admire like, um, um, the compliment. And I really think, think, I do think that, um, my focus over the years has potentially been one of the things that got me, um, so far. Cause I kind of, I just always wanted to put my mind, you know, saying to a certain task and then, you know, do the dirty work that it takes to, uh, you know, accomplish that. And, you know, that's even, that's even beyond, that goes beyond track. You know, that applies to basically everything you can in your life. You know what I'm saying? If you work hard enough and, um, you stay militant enough and you align your, your abilities with, uh, realistic, you know what I'm saying? Goals for yourself or unrealistic, you know what I'm saying? Cause sometimes, you know, you have, sometimes your thoughts can limit your potential. Right. So if you think bigger, you know what I'm saying? You might, you know, it's one of those shoot for a stars and aim, aim for and you land on the moon type right. of thing. Exactly. And so, you know, I just take that same mentality and that same drive and just apply it to, you know, everything I do and uh track just so happened to be one of those things that I had access to as a from a young age and um resources available to help me um take it this far. So um right. like I said, um done a lot but still a long ways to go. Exactly. And that's always the mentality, especially for people like us. It's interesting because it's almost like a tale of two stories, right? You have one side, you know, like I said, we came from similar lineage, right? As it comes you know, with our family and being track and field families, uh, having Olympians on both sides. You know, your mom was actually fast as hell, too. True. So it, people, you know, tend to forget that she was a, a beast. Yeah. So, absolutely. you know, she was she was also a beast. You know, and my mom came in fifth in the Olympics. My dad, you know, would have competed in the Olympics, but they boycotted that year. So, you know, it, it, my sister, you know, ran in the, the Beijing Olympics. So we, we definitely have that that background. 
and but you ended up going pro and i ended up going pro in you know my career yeah, we all so like, pro in something but I you, you, you okay. know what's interesting though is um you know i always told people that you know it doesn't matter what you do it just matters that you definitely have some kind of discipline to be the best that you can possibly want to be at what you want to do. So like for me, people always kind of looked at, you know, my situation as, Oh, you should be like your dad and, you know, be fast and, you know, go pro do all these things. And as I got older, my mind started to change and what I, you know, kind of thought was important for me. And, you know, I went a separate direction. You on the other hand, you kind of like surpassed, you know, even, you know, some of the things that your father did at a very young age. So let's, let's bring it back a bit. Um, when did you first realize that or feel that you were fast or gifted in, you know, in sprints? I'd say that I first discovered that I could be a good sprinter when I was around fifth, sixth, seventh grade, middle school age. Um, I was, I, I knew I was fast when I was a kid. Cause I was always like able to beat everybody in, you know, the, a field day at elementary school or something, or I was playing other sports and I knew I could use my speed to outrun people, but I knew I could be a great sprinter around the time I got to like middle school and I started getting real competitive, but I was like really, really skinny, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Didn't have any, you know, muscle, but I had like the ability, I had the toughness that it took to be a sprinter in the competitive nature, you know, inside of me. And so as my body developed, as I got, you know, a little bit older and I was able to handle, you know, the weight training, the longer running, um, workouts and um, the explosiveness, the plyometrics and things like that. My body, you know, adjusted accordingly and I, I, I molded myself into, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a really good sprinter. And as I, by the time I got to college, uh, I was running, you know, really, really fast. And even my senior year, I was running fast. But, you know, in track, you can run fast. But, you know, mm -hmm. there's a difference between running fast and running elite. Exactly. You know, like, and that's the thing that people don't. They don't get really, it. Really. They do not. Really understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I was able to successfully, you know, um, capture um, NCAA titles and um, things of that nature. But, as you know, saying there's still another level of, mm -hmm. like, eliteness that, it, that you know, the sport demands exactly and so we're like i said even though i've done all the stuff and we're like we're still working to get to that point where like you can be a good sprinter but you have to be like to be an elite sprinter to be in like the nine sevens or below you know mm -hmm. that's a whole different ball game and so there's always something like to you know to achieve and so um i, I say i got the confidence when i was around um around middle school i knew i could do it and then once i went to college i was like okay now you know what I'm saying? If I can get consistently get under 10 seconds or win championships, go compete overseas, it's like now we still have to mm -hmm. go to that next like elite level sprinter um, exactly. step. I, I, I see exactly what you're saying because it's also something I tell people in, in regular lives, right? So it's super easy to be average. It doesn't really take very. much effort at all. Like you can literally just kind of barely do anything and be average at it. To be good, it takes a little bit of effort. You just got to have a smidget of effort and then now you're good, you know, mm -hmm. spend a little bit more time to be elite and great. It takes just think about it. Think about the NBA. You have LeBron James, you have Michael Jordan, those two, arguably the, the best players ever. Great. You know, right. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, players that are really good. Like you could say, you know, I don't want to throw any controversial names out there, but <laughs> you know who the players that are yeah, good, course. but not considered, you know, yeah, elite. The right. people that won't necessarily be remembered like a LeBron, like a Kobe, like, you know, James Harden is, is kind of getting in that range of, you know. Right. You know, so like that to, to make that step takes a lot. Now, yes, it does. The, the, the difference between average to good is very small. It's just a little bit of effort. But from good to elite or great is hours and hours and hours and hours of working on your craft to be truly like above head and shoulders over everyone else. And what's interesting as well is people would think that you didn't have to work very hard for what you have because, oh, your dad was this guy and, and your mom was this and, you know, you had the genetics, blah, blah, blah. But this is why my perspective is so different is I worked out with this guy. Like we were literally teammates for three, four years and during that time, I've seen you out of shape. I've seen you in shape. I've seen you have hard practices. I've seen you have easy practices. And one thing about you is you always knew when you were behind. You're like, you know, this, this, this ain't it. Like, right. like and right. when we see Cam hit bricks at practice, 
like mm-hmm. it, it made you human you yeah. know what i mean like because think about it we all we are in. human yeah you know? we are human and it, 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 that's why i say you know you kind of had that kobe mentality at least that's what i felt and now i've been i've been doing more research on kobe since he's passed away and to be honest i never really was a fan fan because i was a rockets guy but right. i respected his his game because he was cold you know so now that i've been doing more research on kobe and understanding where his mindset was I see a lot of that in kind of your mentality. And like you said, you, you probably don't think that you're quite as sharp as Kobe, but just think about it. How consistent you have been over years and years and years, how, how much pain you've put your body through. You know, I was, I was telling my girlfriend this, you know, whenever we go to the store, I like to park far away and it doesn't bother me to walk that far into the store. And the reason why it doesn't is because I know what it feels like to, to have to run everywhere right and to be in pain and have butt lock right so That's it's fast. incentive for me to the park far away you know mm. mosey on into the store and feel good about somebody not hitting my car so you know i just think that for people who may look at cam or even myself as people who have you know have, have been dealt a good hand even if we were dealt good hands we would have been stuck at good exactly if we exactly. didn't put That's the work facts. in in our respective fields, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be shit. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if, if <laughs> your dad is your dad. If you didn't put the work in and keep sharpening your saws to being who you are today, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have come to fruition how it has. So let's talk about a little bit more. You, you end up going to the University of Houston and, you know, obviously your dad was the head coach. Tell me, what was that decision like, you know, going to the university? I feel like mm-hmm. you probably answered this yeah. question quite a no, bit. but No, actually, not that many people ask me about, like, my journey to UH. Um, it's actually a hilarious story. Um, growing up, like, as a coach's kid, um, you know, you, you, you've seen the recruiting process and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, you, you know how, you know, things are going to go and you have, you know, re- there's nothing like being recruited to a D1 university when you're in high school. I mean, you get to, you know, people are calling you, you're yeah, excited. You feel important. Yeah, you feel important. <laughs> um, you know, so you're getting all these letters coming to your school. Um, you take fl- And then when you actually take on the business, you talk to the coaches and you go visit these schools and, um, you know, you're on planes mm-hmm. and, you know, you're getting picked up from the airport and, you know, you're saying you're, you're going to all these great campuses looking at these facilities and, you know, you're literally meeting a lot of the athletes that you would watch at a TV on TV or at the NCAA championships. And so I knew about all of that, you know what I'm saying, um, growing up. Yeah. And so <laughs> was an I took full advantage of <laughs> the recruiting process when I was um, in high school. I went I took all five visits. Um, <laughs> I, I went to um, I went to um, um Got on planes and just went on to all different, just remote just parts of the up. country. But you knew, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I knew the game, man. <laughs> knew the game. <laughs> I knew the game. Um, had um, you know, they they give you like they give the host, you know, like forty, fifty dollars a day or something like that. And, mm-hmm. and so like you know, like I know they had the money, so I'm yeah. just like, hey, bro, let's go eat, let's go, let's go do this, and or go go to the store and let's go buy this stuff. You know, so yep. you just get come back, you getting clothes, gear, and um, it's nothing like it, but. Deep down inside, I knew that I was um, I was ultimately going to go to U of H. You know what I'm saying? I I I knew deep down inside that's where I would be the best situation mm-hmm. um, for me, where I would get most looked out at. Because recruiters lie. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Rec- recruiters lie. Yes. <laughs> they lie all the time. You know, they, me, tell, we have a- <laughs> they lie all the time. They will they will tell you know some some of these guys will you know there are some you know honest coaches out there that are genuine guys, but you know a lot of them you know inflate yeah. numbers on scholarships and they yes. sell, sell kids dreams and tell their parents that, you know, all oh, your kids are going to be taken care of and, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, in reality, you know, most people aren't, you know, you know, it doesn't, it's not a smooth experience for mm-hmm. everybody in, in actual, in reality, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, either get uh, neglected or um, get cut by a team or whatever, you know what I'm saying? There's all kinds of things that can happen to you. Get injured. They don't look out for you. You know what I'm saying? There's sometimes it never goes, according to plan, you know what I'm saying, for a lot of recruits. But um, so to avoid that, mm-hmm. you know, and all the drama, because I've heard all the horror stories that there, that there are out there, I decided to just, you know, go to, um, go to Houston. I was familiar with the program, familiar with my dad. Carl was joining the staff, and so we were going to start amping up the uh, recruiting efforts and um, the branding of the university. And, yeah, and we just try to build something from, you know, um, the ground up as soon as we got to campus. And, you know, every year, you know, we got a little bit, um, better until 
you know, then we ultimately be, ended up becoming a contender for a national championship. And so it ended up working out in the long run. I, I do believe it was the right decision. That's interesting because I think from like a, someone looking in from the outside will think that, you know, he's going to U of H, you know, you definitely shouldn't go to U of H the same year he goes because he's probably going to be getting special treatment and he's going to be, you know, pampered <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. But I always tell people, I was like, if you didn't know that, you know, Coach Burrell and Cam were related, like before you went to see our practice, you would you would have had no idea that exactly. that was the coach's son. And the, the, the fact of the matter was uh, your dad was was tough on everyone. Like even exactly. you, like you and your dad, you know, butt heads at times. And, you know, it's 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 all love. But at the same time, your dad was like that with everyone. Like he treated us all like we were all a big family, which we were. And shout out to, to Coach Burrell because, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, your dad truly has a, a big heart. And I think that the fact that he cares so much about the team and in the kids and, and developing folks, you know, to, to be the best that they possibly can be, that, you know, he, 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 he wouldn't let that, you know, s- step into the situation. So what, what was your kind of uh, mentality like going into there thinking that, hey, people are probably going to think that, you know, I may be – uh, getting some kind of special treatment or this or that. Did you have ever have some kind of like um, subconscious thought that I need to be even more low key because of the situation, or were you just kind of like, let me just do what I need to do, and you know, I'll let you know my run and talk for itself. I'd say I didn't have any. I I didn't even think about those kinds of things. You know, it's so weird because you know I think people project that onto me Mm -hmm. and it's not even you know a real thing so in my mind I don't even those those kind of thoughts don't even um come across my brain because I don't feel any pressure to be you know like my dad or um better than him or felt like I I didn't feel like I was going to get any special treatment at UH which I didn't yeah you know for all the viewers yeah he didn't (laughs) listen I I didn't you know I wore the same clothes I had the same (laughs) you know pair of shoes I mean we 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 had those what that one day we had the uh they tried to um discipline us or was some something they took away all the clothes and we had like the gilded like t-shirts I'm talking about like Walmart like cotton t-shirts and like the gym shorts the red gym shorts just to like break us down when we like first got to like we we did all that you know what I'm saying? Um, I was part of that too. You know, I didn't get 20 pairs of shoes. Yeah. I, I didn't get the, I didn't always get the newest, you know what I'm saying? Or the freshest spikes. Um, I got the same treatment as everybody yeah. else. You know, I, I got treated like a freshman, yeah. you know, you really, incoming really freshman, <laughs> you know? So um, I, I, I commend U of H for not, you know, spoiling me or, um, you know, things like that, because, you know, I think that's humble. important, <laughs> you know, yeah, humility is important, you yeah. know, especially as an, at a certain, you know, a level of humility goes, you know, a long way because it makes you more coachable. Yeah. Um, it makes you more um, valuable to a team. It makes you, you know, um, listen to others better, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, and the thing is that I, I never really didn't even start becoming like a captain or anything. It's like maybe my junior or senior year, because, you know, it wasn't even, I don't even think it was just because I was good. Doesn't mean it was my place. It, it to wasn't lead. your place to lead. Yeah, to lead. Cause you know, Earl was a good leader. Yeah. You know, he could talk to anybody. He could motivate anybody. He could, um, bring people together you know, on to the Earl. team. Yeah. Shout out to Earl. No, <laughs> um, 400 meter national champion. Um, yeah, he was, I mean, he was, a, he was a great effective leader. He was a role model. He was always on his stuff. You know, yep. everybody, um, you he know, was soft spoken, but yeah, he, he, but he was a firm. But, but he, was he was a, firm. a yeah, he, he was firm. He was firm, exactly. And um, yeah, and so it wasn't necessarily as an eighteen year old, you know, freshman. It, it doesn't. Ma- I don't even think it matters about how good I am, but you know, there's dif- difference between just being a good athlete that everybody watches and a good leader. Mm-hmm. And Earl was both, you yeah. know, at the time. And so I definitely did um did embrace the um the experience of not being you know sport or everybody else. You know, when I got hurt or something like that. I had to go rehab or something. I didn't go to these special doctors yep. or, you know, get any special treatment from the athletic trainers because they had, you know, other people that are hurt too. Yep. Or if I, you know, needed something, you know, I, you know, if we were in a hotel and um, we were sharing, uh, it was two to a room, one each bed or something like that. I didn't go, hey, I didn't go like, yeah. hey, I need my own room or I ain't coming on yeah. the trip. I'm like, no, like, you know, you, you embrace those moments. And I think that's what makes you um, a better teammate overall. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think a certain level of humility is like super, super, super important to the um, to building of a team and a culture of um, that can win. You know, right. And what's interesting, too, is 
we had this conversation a long time ago, or at least back when I was at my other spot. Fun fact. I used to cut Cam's hair a lot. So, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> we used to have, like, mm -hmm. barbershop conversations. All the time. Yeah. So, um, the what I had mentioned was um, you you were always such in your element when you were on the track. Like, especially competing, specifically. And we were able to see your personality come out, especially when you would win, you know, a race or, you know, or anything that was dramatic. You know, we would see that kind of come out of your, you know, personality. And a lot of people um, may think that you're much of a, you know, introvert or quiet person, but they just don't know you as a person or know your intellect. And I think it's 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 interesting that s people can have such strong opinions about someone who they don't even know. Exactly. Like I've literally heard people say stuff to someone that they've talked about to me, and I'm just like, who who is that? Like who, exactly like, who. Like, why do they care that I didn't go you. pro? Like, who are they? Like, so yeah. I think, you know, the fact that, you know, we, we have conversation often and I know you as a person, I know where your mindset is and, you know, what you're trying to do is just super frustrating when, you know, there are outside voices and there's no avoiding it, no matter what level of competition you are, whether you're high school, because even then there were people talking Oh, you know, he's never going to beat so and so. You know, he's got to wait till he graduates, or blah blah blah, or you know, he gets to college, yeah, and you know, is is he ever going to amount to what is that, or blah blah blah? And it's like you just keep proving everybody wrong, step by step by step, and eventually you get to the point where it's like LeBron James, like he he's doing everything that he's doing, and people are still like, nah, you know, he he still sucks, mm. you know. Well, he doesn't suck, it's but he's always not. something, you know, man, man can't be pleased. Mm -hmm. There's there's always going to be some hater. Somebody that's unhappy, you know, somebody that is it could be jealous or, you know, disappointed in themselves or, you know, or just insecure about it. And they always just have to project that mm -hmm. onto other people. You know, that's what cancerous and, you know, insecure people do. Just throwing all kinds of negative energy to people's way. And, you know, you as a person, you just got to be able to block that out. You know, I, I, I especially in this era, you know, saying we were you know, everything is digitalized and, you know, you don't always have to interact with people face to face. You know, it becomes easy to do, you know, stuff like that, to talk about people. And um, but I also think that you just have to build up your own mental block, you know, in mm -hmm. your own head to be able to, you know, block all that stuff out and worry about the things that you can't control. You know, you can't control what people say or or what they say behind your back or talk about you or um, if they like you or not or, you know, anything. And uh, kudos to LeBron because he was very harshly criticized like you know mm -hmm. early on in his career i mean that kid was he was 18 years old years 18 old when he got old. into the league you know in the hottest prodigy in basketball at the time and you know when cleveland wasn't delivering championships you know in the first um portion of his career yeah i mean he had cleveland all, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean like look no but like seriously like there, people had talked about him like a dog man yeah. you know like and I mean, he was young, you know, he was Cleveland. still, he was still, you know, developing and stuff like that. So, you know, he goes to Miami, he wins, he goes back to Cleveland, he wins. Um, and he now in Los Angeles, you know, he wins too. And so it, does all that talk that happened, you know, 10, 15 years ago, does that even matter anymore? Like, no, you know what I'm saying? Cause everybody has their own path to, um, success or greatness or whatever it is, you know, or whatever it is. And, um, you know, you just can't get too blindsided or too caught up in, you know, the naysay and th especially in things that you can't control. And, you know, like people, you know, doubting you or, mm -hmm. or projecting their own insecurities onto you as an athlete. And as a person, you know, you have to be able to block that out. And I think that's a skill that a lot of people need to develop a lot more because we yes. worry about a, what people say entirely too much. I think. Yeah. It, I it, think it, so. it, it, it's, it's definitely true. And I think that for someone like you who like, like, I think it's very mentally strong, especially the workouts that we've gone through yeah. and like to, to power through yes. it. And, 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 you know, it, it takes a different track level. Hurts. Yes, it hurts. Track, track hurts, definitely boy. hurts. It's, 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 it's not it fun hurts. going to not. For us. What's fun is winning. And when you're yes. not winning, life sucks. When you're not like, winning, when you're out of shape. Yes. You know, when you got, when it's Monday, you know, I, I think, I, I don't think track gets a, a, enough credit for how difficult mm -hmm. like, moments like that can be, but no, you have, you're absolutely right. Yeah, because I think, you know, people like me, I get more upset when I hear people say things about, you know, the homies like, you know, Eli, you know, um, Mario, it, pretty much anybody who I know that as an athlete that I, you know, kind of worked with or, you know, were on the same team. Like, when, any negative, because I'm like, these dudes work so hard, like, for one, I know, I know it don't bother y'all. Like, mm -hmm. when people talk bad about me, I don't care because it's me. You know what I mean? Like, I know I'm going to do me. But 
I get mad for other people because like th- these are my guys, you know, like when, when Cam is in a race, I don't care who's in that race. You cannot count Cam out. Like he he's going to be in the mix at least, you know what I mean? So like, I think that the fact that, you know, you have built up that, that mental toughness, you know, is why you keep, you know, excelling and keep going, you know, further and, for, and further, um, you know, reaching your goal and, and creating an, uh, the new goal. So like you said, you went to U of H, you, you came in just like how I came in, uh, you know, fresh meat. We was in there, you know, getting those workouts in. Yeah. And, um, you know, you started to progress really quickly, um, started to, to drop times. Um, and what was interesting, I remember at Texas, was it Texas Relays, you had dropped a 1007? Yes. Yeah, senior year of high school. Yeah. So senior year of high school, dropped a 1007. Dated, yes. I don't care. That was, <laughs> yes. that, that was if, if y'all haven't for seen clarity it, purposes. Yeah. yeah. If y'all haven't seen it, just go on YouTube and search Cam and Burrell, uh, 1007, you know, uh, Texas Relays. And now to give you perspective, when we, when we were in high school, that's what Cam was doing to people. Just to give me our perspective, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, you, you go to U of H, you know, we all go through the hell of, you know, growing pains and, and trying to get better, become, you know, a team. And really, it all started with Earl, but it really all started with our class because our class is when we were able to see the full potential that could have been, you know, if we just kept going and going. Right. And then we brought Carl into the situation or Carl came into the situation around, you know, my our sophomore year, junior year, one of those years. And we really just went, you know, for it. We got Mario in. We got some quality jumpers. We got Tremaine. Shout out to Tremaine. And, you know, that's when, you know, you really started to come into your own as a leader. And I think what's interesting is when we first came, did you feel like you were still a kid, like, in in your mind? Like, like for me, I felt like when I saw Earl and when I saw Leon and I saw the, you know, uh, Jamal, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're men. You know yeah, what I mean? And yeah. they were, you yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah. And we were still, you know, kids. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, as we grow up, we see, you know, us start to become those men and like the, you know, the younger guys come in and, you know, that transition starts to happen. What was that like for you? Like understanding that you were now the guy? Um, It was cool. It, it, it was cool. Um, I knew that Um, I knew around like my junior to uh, senior year that I was uh, started to compete like you know, fairly well. And I could be like a focal point of, um, of the team and that people were watching, um, what I was doing and, you know, gr- you know, going through that phase of life is cool. Cause you, you can look back and you at yourself and you can see the progress that you made. And, you know, I, I'm glad you brought up that point that like, um, uh, about Leon and Jamal and, you know, Earl and, you know, our teammates like that, because, you know, they were, those guys were, you know, 22, um, 20, maybe 23 years old. I think Jamal was even like, 25 when maybe yeah more years so like he, yeah. he was my age now yeah. and it's, it's still competing and just to have that kind of seniority that presence you know mm-hmm. it kind of it's motivating it's it motivating cool. yep yeah it's cool but no i definitely felt like an 18 year old kid i was I, mean, I was a freshman you know I just went to college and you know you're fresh out of your parents house you got your own place and you know you have a little bit of money and yep. um the little um freedom you know stuff like that so no i, I definitely felt like a like a kid um and, you know, seeing those guys, I mean, um, I mean, Leon, you know, it was a solid dude. He was in their bench in, like, yeah, 315. <laughs> Leon you know, like, could have played receiver, like, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> like that. You know, um, Jamal had, like, a three series, like, BMW or, or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, all, all those guys have their own. Like, we live on campus, and, like, they got yeah. their off-campus off apartments and, like, yep. stuff like that. It was like, no. It's like, so, it, it, was, it was cool to see that, you know, um, to see the maturity in those guys, to see um, their development and – aspire to be like that and so when I um became a junior or senior upperclassman whatever whatever you want to um call it um I definitely felt you know embraced that role too but mm-hmm. I also you know didn't overlook the moments of my freshman years of all the lessons that I had to learn to get to that point or the um the L's I had to take the amount of things that I had to do work on um you know what I'm saying I don't I, you know I did feel like a kid but at the same time you know I had and I had I still had those freshman moments I still had those I yeah. made those mistakes that to, that led up to the point of me being that guy you know or what have you on campus um or on the track team so um I, I was able to appreciate the journey that was the beautiful thing about going to UH if anything I would say like when you were on the team um at, at least in our earlier days you your presence was more like a of a Kawhi Leonard in the sense of like you wouldn't say much if somebody was doing what they weren't supposed to do because you were like, I guess in your mind, 
let me prove myself first that I have the authority to tell you what you're doing ain't yeah. right. Yeah. And then as you kind of progress, you became more of like that Kobe where it's like, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, come on, dude. Right. Like, it's more like if, if Cam calls you out, you just feel like shit. Like, I feel ashamed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, man. Um, It was one of those things where, like I said, you, you're right. I wasn't, Um, I'm a lot more vocal now, especially mm-hmm. than I was back then. Um, Just about a lot of things and in, in general. But, you know, I felt, you know, I was a new you know, freshman, a new guy on the block. I didn't feel like I had as much leverage to stand on, you know what I'm saying? It's, and it's, like, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're a fresh, it's, it's just a seniority complex, you yeah. know, thing. we still have that amongst, you know, teams and even on um, D1 teams. Like I said, if I haven't really proven myself to be like a, a, a super big factor, you know, I'm not going to go to, you know, I'm not going to go to the seniors or whatever, especially <laughs> if I don't, especially if like, you know, I, I'm not going to go to Earl and be like, yeah, bro, like, what what the fuck are you gonna practice? <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Or, what the or, hell was or that? You, yeah, what the hell was that? Or you you run, you know I'm not gonna and I'm not a that I wasn't a confrontational of yeah. like a person. So you know we're not gonna. Um, I, I didn't want to like get into that because it wasn't an ego mm-hmm. you no know, contest. It really to wasn't. Me. It wasn't. You know I just I just wanted to be the best that I could and you know try to you know contribute the best to the team. And you know a lot of times when you come at people all kinds of sideways and. You know, you causing problems or because there's a big difference between, you mm-hmm. know, giving somebody advice to help them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying something just trying to tear somebody down. It's a exactly. very thin line between that. And so I didn't really want to. The older I got and the more, I guess, credibility I was able to um, get on the team. I just kind of just like got a little bit closer to, you know, being a fair, I guess, yeah. uh, leader or motivator, whatever you want to call it on the team. And not just, you know, pick on people just because I could. Yeah. You know, it's always a purpose. But if I ever got on somebody or um, got into it with anybody on the team, there was there was some intent behind it. Yeah, Because exactly. I'm not just here to just cause problems, you know. It's um, like, at that point, you don't need to, like, you, yeah. you you got to go on yourself. Like, if anything, if you don't want to accept the criticism or, you know, the advice, then that's on you, you know. Exactly. But at this point, I'm a leader. I'm not going to keep my mouth shut because I care about you. You know what I mean? Right. So that's that's kind of where it, it, it ended up, you know, and – to be honest, you could have been doing that a lot earlier. I think you already gained the respect, especially once, you know, practice starts and we're all hitting bricks, you know, even you hitting bricks. And then, mm-hmm. like, you know, we all start to push through together by the end of the season. And, you know, we're, you know, we're a team. We're, we're, we're going through it, you know, as a team. So, um, and then you start dropping the times, you know, everybody's rallying around you. We're like, oh, okay, Cam, you know, <laughs> you, you know, so it, but I guess from, from, th- from that perspective, you, you start to make that jump into a, a true leader and, you know, you start to start, uh, you start to get national recognition for different events. The 60 meters. Um, I, I think you dropped a, a six four eight, right? Junior year, yes, at nationals. And you ended up at nationals. What place did you end up getting? Second. Second. Yes. Okay. So second place at nationals your junior year with the six four eight, which is flying. That that could have won most years. I know. So. Unbelievable. <laughs> so you know. It, sometimes track is just like that. It's just unlucky. It like, is like that, especially if you're Tyson Gay. You know, mm-hmm. it, going through the Usain Bolt era. You know, I, I think that it it, it is so yeah. unfortunate when there's that, that one contest, other guy, yeah. Yeah. that one other guy, that one person, that one year that just happened to do something. You know, but you know, shout out to Tyson. He's a, a family friend and you know, a real cool dude. Um, what's interesting is like people. Track is a social sport, so it like is. if if you are somewhat in the scene, at least at a collegiate level, then nine times out of 10, you met most of the pros or you've been around them. Right. Right. So I, I just think it's cool that, you know, I've, I've met pretty much every, I don't have met Usain, but I've met pretty much mm-hmm. everyone, Asafa, you know, Blake. Um, yeah. They, they, they come around. Yeah. Even all the other like European and uh, um, um, other American pros, like they, you you can see them at one point or another if you're in the track community. So yeah, there's there's a decent amount of visibility um, amongst the pros for sure. I agree. And 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 also I I believe that a lot of the pros that I've you know interacted with are very very you know they're they're grounded they're very humble people and they're willing to help you. So like if if you are a young person like you, let's say you're in high school and you go to one of these bigger track meets that have you know, college people and, you know, have also high school and potentially pros. Don't be afraid to just reach out and say, you know, hey, you know, I'm a fan or, you know, um, you know, 
could you help me here? I'm trying to, you know, better my, you know, whatever, because people, we, we want to help. And I say, we like, like I'm still doing it, mm -hmm. but like, you know, the pros, they definitely, cause you think about it when, when you're young, you want to be in that position where you can say, you know, I want to get back and help, you know, the kids that, you know, so it's definitely a, a great community, you know, to be in track and field. So, um, I agree. Um, track is a great community. Um, I, don't even really think it gets enough credit for how popular it is. You yep. know, summer track growing up was a big deal. It was a big deal. You know, there was a lot of people involved and a lot of families, you know, from even some of the local um, clubs. We had like two, three practice sites. Track Houston had like 20. Yep. <laughs> and like, you know, um, everybody, you know, all these coaches and all these families and communities are involved. Um, and you say every high school has a track team. All those track teams go, all those kids in the summer, they go run track too or um, stuff like that. And there's kids out there, you know, like four or five, six-year-old kids out there in the summertime. And so, and it doesn't matter if you go to LA, yep. Phoenix, Houston, New Orleans, Memphis, uh, it's lit. Florida, you know, track is everywhere. It's everywhere. You know, my concern is just like, you know, I do wish that like, um, I wish more people knew that, access to the professionals and you know um elite sprint college or pro sprinters or whatever you know they're we're in they're in the backyard you know yes. what I'm saying they're all they're all over the place they're and they're in the you know saying they're in the communities i mean we don't even the only thing that we don't really do is compete here that much yep. in america and so that's why i think needs to change you know the um we had to find a way to get the pros and the, get the money and the meat promoters in in here because yes. you know what i'm saying I've seen, you know, the UIL regionals packed out, yes. you know, um, JLs packed out mm -hmm. for 10 days in a row. Hot as hell. Yeah. Hot <laughs> as hell. Sardined yeah, up. Yeah. You know, um, all that stuff. Uh, NCAA championships in Austin was, you know, packed. And so um, I just think that we just need to, you know, get those figureheads. Because like I said, all the athletes, you know, are most mm -hmm. of the sprinters, at least sprinters, jumpers, um, and even like a significant portion of the American distance community are, are in America in yep. the, you know, in the Caribbean. Exactly. And so I just would just like to see more um, visibility um, competition wise. More you know, of a chance. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, when I was in high school and um, you saw Asafa Powell at the UH indoor meet, I thought that was, or, or I think it was, that was in high school. I think it was like a, um, he was there quite a, a few times. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, I was yeah, like, I'm like, I never oh, seen. Snap. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I, I, say, I never, I never seen you know a pro sprinter like coming to a track like me like this. You know, yeah. so I always see them at the Diamond Leagues on TV or in Rome or Paris or something like that. And so I do think we need to figure out a way to to bring that back here because like mm -hmm. if the, if if all the athletes live in this portion of the world and all of we we have the all, all these really really big you know track communities in these um cities down south especially you know i think we got to find a way to get the pros here yep. you know more people here and i think it will bring a lot of excitement to the community and i think people will really buy into it as well yep and another thing that's interesting too is if you're in high school and let's say you compete run track or whatever track has a way of humbling you because my first ever track meet uh, at U of H was an indoor meet mm -hmm. and your dad stuck me in a four by four <laughs> with some dogs. Oh my. And believe me, there were, there were five teams in that race. Um, I forget what the teams were, but I know that TCU and Texas A&M was there. Essentially there were three Olympians that were first leg and I was first leg. Right. And you know, Dion Lindor, he, he yeah. put it on me. Like <laughs> I got some was, no, I mean we we yeah we got caught in his line of fire. He was good that that year, you yeah. know. He ran like forty four eight something like the year. You know, but he's an Olymp a full blown Olympian at exactly, a college meet. Exactly. You know, and, and th that's I say all that to say this, like you know, the talent in track and field is everywhere. It's in college. It's in the pros. Absolutely. It's in high school. So you know, you're going to get matched up. I even think I I, I raced. Um, did I race a soft? I, I raced some pro. At some um inv not invitational but one of those all comer meets, mm -hmm. and I'm like, why the hell am I in this? <laughs> <laughs> it happens, you know. It, it happens. So you know, I think you know from that perspective, um, you know, track is one of those sports where, you know, you you could race MJ. You know, there's a chance that you can race the MJ of exactly. Track. You could race Cameron Burrell if you're in the right place you, at, at the, the right, right time. time. Yes. So that, you know, I, I think that's pretty cool. But yeah, you know. the um the thing about track, you know, um. And especially in other in Olympic sports like swimming, track, and you know, 
time based sports where the results is, there there is no very little room for mm-hmm. debate. Yep. <laughs> you know, basketball you have stati- football you have statistics, you have quarters, you have um halves. Yep. You have, you know, um tournaments, yep. you have playoffs. You know, in track <laughs> You don't have that. Yep. You have a time and you have a distance, yep. you know, and you have a foul board or, you know, Olympic trials. Everything's super US, measurable. It's very measurable. There's no room for error. Mm-hmm. None. Like there's, there's no debate about a person who runs 995 versus a person who runs 1025. Exactly. You know, there's not, there's no way that you can have like a middle ground to even argue you know what I'm saying? About who's a better sprinter. You exactly. know what I mean? At 1025 so, is no slouch. It's, like, yeah, it's not. But that's that's like I said, you know, that's the difference between the, you know, the elite. elite and you know, good. And good, exactly. It's a mile away in track. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So there's just no room for error. I'd argue that it's arguably the most cutthroat sport in the world. It is, because the, the, you the know? fact of the matter is what is cool though, is let's say you run this time that's the fastest time ever ran. Then technically, you're the best who ever did it. Exactly. So you know, it, it's that you know, is that definitive? Like, it, like you said, it's not like football or basketball. How you could say, well, during his era or during this, no, you ran <laughs> nine four. Exactly. You are the fastest. You are the greatest person who ever did it. Exactly. So you know, from that aspect, you know, it, it makes competition more, you know, more challenging Very. and and less debatable, which <laughs> could could be a, a good and a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um. But, you know, going back into kind of your career, all right, now you're this leader mm-hmm. and you, you've proven yourself. You worked with people, you know, to better them on the team. You have a, a contending team. You're going into your red shirt senior year outdoor. What is the vibe like? What, what is on your mind at that point? Uh, I just needed to finish the mission. Um, we had almost put everything together. We, we, I think we had won the relay that year. Mm-hmm. And so we we're like, okay. We have the team that's capable of doing some serious damage, yep. but we're having some injuries, you know, at some critical moments. Um, we can all still afford to improve, you know, on our individual game a little bit more. We need some more. We need a little bit more out of, you know, a lot of the guys that were um, um, kind of like in the in between, yeah, in the in between, you know, borderline. Being, yeah, borderline guys. Um, like uh, Amir, yeah, Tremaine, Mario. We needed, like I said, we needed super talented yeah, Brian guys Marazza. that just needed to yeah, show up. Yeah, they just up needed. Yeah, we just needed a, a little bit more out of everybody. And so, I think that year, it was just about the motivation of getting you know to that yeah. point because it's like wow, you know, just like that, we went from being like ranked thirty something, twenty something in the country, you know, on a regular basis. It's like okay, wow, we're top. Now we're top ten. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we're consistently top ten. Yep. Oh, wow, we can actually win this thing. So let's just get going into this year. Let's cut all the crap out. That's all the, all the issues. We even got all the bad recruits out of there. <laughs> you <laughs> get know, out of there. Um, we, we said we, we said we don't have any off the field issues, um, off the, or off the track issues or what have you. Let's like focus and like um, really finish like what we uh, set out to do. You know, it's like um, I, I'd say that team was just like a like an orange. Yeah. Like if you take an orange and you just like squeeze out the juice, we had like a little bit of juice left and we just needed to make that last like squeeze to like just like let it let it go so we can create the team, you know, an envi- envir- environment conducive to win a championship. Right. So we just didn't need to make that last little push. That's all. And you you get to the championship meet and you know, you're at the the finals for the 100 meters. We have three Cougs in there. We have yourself, we have Mario Burke who is, you know, originally from Barbados. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Mario. He's also a pro athlete at this point. Yes. And Eli Hall Thompson, which is also homie from A Leaf. Shout out to Eli. Mm-hmm. Three of y'all made it, which is like insane. I don't think we've ever had three Cougs in the final. And if we have it, it's been a long time. No, yeah. I, I, I think we were the third school or something or second or third school. Don't fact or well, fact check me on this, but we're one of the only schools in history to have three of the people from the same team in the final. And, you know, you know, that's a big feat in, yeah. in its own right. And the fact that the way it played out. So what was your mindset when you were in the blocks? What what did you feel at that moment? All right. Backstory. Um, before the hundred meter um, final, we had the 3000 steeplechase. <laughs> 
right, literally right before like we 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 were um we were I think it was, it was a three k steeple, and then I think they ran the women's hundred, and mm-hmm. then the men's hundred. So we were. We weren't even warming up. We like we were in, <laughs> we were in um the tent like area. Um, we had like warmed up and we had like literally stopped our warm up because we saw that Brian Barraza was in first place. Oh, it was nice. the most like. Do you remember that when yeah. um um when he was like leading the um the steeple and unfortunately he fell. Yeah, but no, like I think Brian had like barely made the the steeple final like the day before, and so but you know he had some something in him and like he had just. I don't know. He's just running out of Shout his out body. Shout out to Brian. That yeah. guy. That guy. He was a just piece. running out of his body, and so like, we, and like this is the most like, bro. Like we're 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 at the at the blocks, and they got all those other guys, um, you know, in the hundred final, um, that were just warming up and just going at it in the warm period. Like you can hear them, and like they're just working really hard, and the coaches are clapping and blowing whistles and yelling, and you know, it's all this crazy stuff going on. And we were really just over there, like watching tv bro like it was crazy and so like we're just screaming at the tv and everybody's like looking at us because it's like oh that's houston like they see the boys about to win you know and unfortunately um he went down we was just like, oh my gosh and it's like it, it's just like we went from like a really really high to like a really really low like real quick yeah. and so um it's just like from a it was just a, it was just a tragic moment and so but i think it was a lot of um a lot of character was built in that moment because it was like okay now we got. Now we have to like. We gotta have his back. Yes, we gotta have his. Yeah, we have to have his back. You know, what I'm saying, and the whole crowd just saw a University of Houston athlete. You know, what mm-hmm. I'm saying, uh, take a tumble because he was winning by like like a by daylight, and the guys behind him were just dying. You know, if you go back and watch that race, and so, yeah, we just um we we pulled it together and um went back to go warm up. Did a, did a couple little push outs or whatever, and then, so I was in really good shape. And I was really sharp around that time, so it didn't it didn't take that much for me to to get, warm to get and right and get warmed up. And so we're walking down the um you know the, the blocks, and you know I hug Eli and hug Mario. And I was like, look, bro, like let's do this for Brian because like you know what I'm saying he just put his line, he just basically put his body on the line for us, and, you know. And unfortunately, it just didn't work out. And so we're just like, yeah, like you know, saying let's go do this. Um, and me and Eli went in, went um end up going one two in that race. Uh, Mario unfortunately didn't run um as well, but you know, he was in there. That's but, all that. Yeah, yes, but he the, was there. Yes, exactly. But the way he, the way that he made an impact, and what, it, what he may not realize, or it may not be talked about, is that in the prelims, he took out a very good sprinter. Oh, I mean, yeah. like Jalen Bacon from Arkansas State was hot. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he was hot. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. He had ran like 998 or something at the um at the um regional meet. Yep. And something, but like Mario went to went to the prelims day, and he like he and he beat him, and like yep. he took him like completely out the final. So it doesn't matter in my book. It doesn't matter if you didn't you know win or get third place or or whatever, bro. You took out a like a really good sprinter, you and you put gave, a Houston yes, athlete in that, in that yeah, an opportunity to to get that lane. Yep. You know, in nationals points is everything. everything. I don't care if it's one point. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So that's um all in all. That's basically what we went through before, right before um, the hundred meter final. So it was really kind of like one of those moments where, um, you just wanted you, you didn't think about yourself, yeah. you know. Um, looking back at it, it probably it, it's it's not it wasn't even my really my favorite race, yeah. you know. Um, the t- it wasn't fast. We ran into like a two negative two point something head when the weather in Oregon's always terrible. Yeah, it's always terrible. It's always something. Um, it was rain. It was raining that day. It was. Um, it was, it was like. 58, 60 degrees, raining, headwinds. It was a terrible day for track, but, you know, we were in shape. And, um, just gotta, gotta yeah, you just got to go get, you just, just got to go win at that point. You just got to go do it anyway about, just to win. When, when the elements are like that, it's like, yeah. man, forget it. Let me just win. Exactly. You know, I don't care what I what I run as long as, you know, I, yeah. I get the place I'm looking for. So Exactly. And so, yeah, we just wanted to just do that for him. You know, nice. it, it wasn't about it wasn't about me or, you know, UH. Even UH for that matter. I was like, bro, I saw what some guy I go to war that's with. My, just yeah, that's my guy. And I was like, let me let me just go do this to him. You know, do this for him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's 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 a little backstory about that that um that race. It was it was it was a good moment though. That, that's uh, I think that's pretty cool you say that because you know pe- people aren't going to get that backstory in like it, it, unless they watch this podcast exactly, and they're going to think okay, Cam finally got his 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 you know solo ring and you know he he did it for himself. But you know it's quite the opposite. You yeah. you had someone else in mind when it was your time to shine, and and that possibly gave you what you needed to you know fulfill the, the destiny that you set for yourself. 
Um, Probably so. And also, y'all go ahead and y'all win the four by one. So, you, you know, you get the double crown for, you know, your solo and, you know, your, uh, you know, the, the relay, which is fantastic. And now we're at a situation where you are making a decision to go pro. Mm -hmm. What is that process like? And what, what were your thoughts? Um, go, the go, whole going pro thing in track bridge was something that I never really put a lot of thought to. I was like, if I run fast, if I win some way, somehow this is going to happen. Mm. And so I didn't go into, or I, like after it, after literally after I, um, um, day two or day three or whatever of NCAAs, I was literally thinking to myself, I was like, okay, I didn't even think this far. You yeah. know, I, I was so caught up in trying to, you know, run fast and do what I had to do that to what I do to get pro. I was like, what do I actually, you know, go from here? And so we had like a, um, we did have a plan that didn't exactly, that worked, but it didn't exactly work. Um, I ended up basically just going overseas to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, got a, got with got with the agent that got me into some meets. Started running just a little bit. Um, I went to London to do the World Cup meet, and um, I went to I got I got a lane in the London Diamond League meet. Um, nice. That was an awesome experience. Um, I was fresh out of college, you know. what I'm yep. saying that, like, you know, I was like, "Wow, I'm here." Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm at the yeah, I'm at this. Yes, yeah, like I'm. I was just in college. It's like, wow. Like, I didn't even. I didn't know it was going to happen that fast. Yeah. Um, but like, um, as far as like, you know, the sponsors and the contract stuff that, that, that took a lot longer than we had originally planned. Yep. Um, I didn't end up signing with uh, Nike or Red Bull until like January. Okay. Around yep. that, around that range. And so, um, it, it's kind of one of those things where, um, it's not like other sports. Yeah. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not about teams and drafting and stuff like that. You know, it's about, you know, having, I guess, um, <clears throat> a certain relationships with people and mm -hmm. um, certain relationships with agents. And, and timing, you know, and, pretty and much. And timing, yeah, yep. exactly. Timings, budgets, meet promoters. It's a very, very complex, you know, um, thing to do to, to transition from a college um, athlete to a pro, at least from my perspective, at least from my um, my story, because it wasn't as simple as just, you know, signing a piece of paper yeah. and just going out there. Like, no, I... I I end up having to do like a lot of extra things to make like it said, work. To, to make it to like to make it work, and so um, but it's but I said the transition was a was a good it happened, mm -hmm. um the first year just didn't just wasn't a successful year, mm -hmm. um a lot of trial and error yep. as far as the program to, to was concerned you know I never had to travel fourteen hours yep. you know what I'm saying to go to a track meet yep. you know on a on a plane to Japan change time zones and. You know, losing bags, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of things that you know happen. Um, never had to be that far away from home for that long period of time because you know, in track, you know, you don't just sometimes you don't just go to one meet and go back. You'll go overseas to Europe. You'll do like three, four meets. Exactly. You know, and then you, you go back home. In each one, you're traveling by yourself. You're warming up by yourself. Um, and it was just a, a lot of things. And you said, my dad. It's not still, it's still at UH, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're still college. My dad and Carl are still college coaches. And so it wasn't what I it was, mm. I was, what I was used to. And so I had a hard time. Um, but like now that I have like this, um, the experience under my belt and I have like an idea of like um, the direction that, you know, we're trying to go in, set like some specific goals and have things that we know we have to do to be good and incorporate that into, reincorporate that into our program and redesign it around a professional structure, I think we're going to do a lot better this year. Yep. Um, unfortunately, um, COVID took the ascent most of the season away, and we just, I just opted not to compete this year, just, yep. to, just to, for the simple fact that, you know, if the goal is to go to the Olympics, you know, we're going to focus on the Olympics. the Olympics. You know, not just go overseas and just to win some prize money and or some quick prize money or, you know, like saying little things and put my body through all this you know yeah. stuff when it really isn't necessary because worth it you know, for the yeah angle. in the long yeah if you're thinking the long term you know I just yep. didn't think it was worth it. No, I, no. I I totally understand that, and um, <sighs> I guess you know with that, you know we're, we're kind of getting close to our end. But this is the question I get mm -hmm. a lot, being you know on you know or from being on the team at, at U of H, working with Leroy Bur Burrell, Carl Lewis. What is it like working? 
you know, uh, working with Carl Lewis on a on a regular. What is your experience? Interesting guy. Interesting guy. Um, I think he's a great motivator. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you really have to know the context of the sport mm-hmm. to know how good that guy actually was. Yeah. You know, and so. Oh, hold on. I don't want to cut yeah. you off, but nine time Olympic yeah. gold medalist, yes. Carl Lewis. This is what we're talking about. So if you don't know who he is, didn't figure it out, <laughs> please. You know, and so I, I do think that, you know, he, he, just being around somebody who's been there, done that. And he has those stories to tell and the experience and, you know, the know all, the, the know the knowledge to um to uh shed on an athlete, I think that is a very I think it's you know priceless. Okay. It's 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 priceless. Being around that and he knows physically what it takes mm-hmm. to get to that point. And so he's not going to shortcut you of that. And it shows yep. in the workouts. Yes. You know, it shows. The breakdowns. Yes. <laughs> it shows. And so um it's been a it's been an awesome experience um, working with super fun guy. He knows how to have fun too. Yep. He's not just always overly militant or overly you know strict. He can be your friend too. Yep. Um, but um, I I just overall I do think it was you know it's been really really beneficial for me to you know to um have been able to be or just a, like at least around him in that sense over the, you know over the years. Um, you know you know what's super funny happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny is because like people when they ask me that question. My my mannerisms are similar to what you say. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, it's interesting because it Carl, is. he's he's one of those guys that you look up to because he's not afraid to be himself and do it. Like, right. and you know, he he he's saying he's <laughs> done the rock star thing. Yeah, you know, he he, he you know what he's done. He's done so much stuff, mm-hmm. and I truly admire how he 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 does it. Yeah, and like very few people can say that I live my life to the fullest. He's one of those guys yes, who be like when he, he dies. He's he's gonna be able to say I've done everything I, I, I've, I've set out to do. to do. Yeah, and you know, shout out to Carl Lewis. You know, mm-hmm. he, we actually just followed each other on Instagram uh, not not too long ago, and he's he's been working out. He's in shape and everything. So like, mm-hmm. and Carl, what is it like fifty, fifty five, something like that? I think a little bit older than that, but around that around that range, yeah. Yeah. So it, you know, shout out to Carl. Follow him on Instagram because if you know if, if you need some motivation, you know, Carl is always doing something. Yeah, yeah. It's there. So um. Yeah, um, great to work with though. Yeah, definitely great, great, to, work, to, work great with. to work with. And you know he's he's a real person, like a real yes. guy. Carl, he definitely um, played an integral role in you know my career as an athlete and super great motivator, super great person to work with. Um, it's inspiring, you know, to to be around you know somebody who's that great. And like I said, you have to understand the context of you know the Olympics and track and field and how the sport works to under to really put it into you know. Um, Really to put to put it all to, to understand the whole picture of things, but not yep. super super great coach to work with, and definitely uh definitely a good guy you want in your corner. And also just to let y'all know, like we we had a very fun team. So like we we would come out to practice and we would literally like you know sing the national anthem just to oh get a reaction God. from Carl. <laughs> and Carl like the speaker, yeah. Carl can definitely hold his own when it comes to like roasting and all that stuff. So like. It was definitely yeah. a fun relationship that, you know, we had and, you know, something that I think everybody on that team or at least that currently, you know, is, is you know, working with him on the team um, can can cherish because it's good, like you said, to have that person that's been there, done that and really mm-hmm. been there, done that exactly. to the highest level, mm-hmm. but also can be relatable and, you know, cr- can't crack jokes, make, make you kind of take the edge off sometimes and, and feel more relaxed going into a race because, you know, he said something funny or, you know, something like that. Exactly. So. It's a, and that's a life skill, you know, that a coach, you know, um, can bring to the table as well. He has like a lot of life skills, just a lot of knowledge and just a good human, you know, yeah. that, that could, that, and I, I think it, you know, you if you're a good to be in terms of to be a good coach, you know, it's not even just necessarily about technique and yep. science. Like sometimes you gotta be a good motivator, mm-hmm. a good you gotta be a, a good therapist. You gotta yep. be a good person to to shoulder to cry on. Yep. Um, a good and also like I said, and then, then do then you get all to the technical stuff, you know, too about track. But all in all, he's just definitely a good person that you know, to do all of the above. Exactly. And I would love to sit here and ask <laughs> more questions and have more discussions. And we will I'll come back off camera, <laughs> but you know, I know y'all probably like this interview getting long or podcast getting long, but anyway, uh, any kind of closing statements for you, Cam? 
Um, no, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, super, super happy to be here. Um, like I said, anytime, um, follow me on Instagram. Um, it's at CB94 underscore. I just made my new Instagram. My old one got deleted, unfortunately, but we're going to get this new one back up, up and running and uh, get back to square business. So exactly. thank you guys. Exactly. And definitely, um, you know, look out for Cam. You know, he's, he's, you know, been through a lot as far as, you know, um, you know, going through trials and tribulations to get to where he needs to be, uh, getting his body prepared, getting mentally, you know, prepared to, to take on new things. And I, I think that this is just the, the beginning. So when you guys are watching this podcast, you know, four years down the road at, you know, the, the Olympic gold medalists, you know, just remember that, you know, this conversation that we had and where he is today and where he will be. I'll start so. somewhere. All got to start somewhere, mm-hmm. no matter where you are in life. Exactly. You just got to go for it and, you know, trust the process. If anything, track and field taught me that, you know, in order for you to see results, you have to be patient because you're not yes, going to, you, you know, you're not going to run your PR, you know, next week if you just started training today. <laughs> you know what I mean? It may take you two years to run your PR or to get back where you need to be. So, you know, just, you know, trust the process, stay consistent you know, motivate yourself. And if you're not motivated naturally, then surround yourself with people who are going to motivate you and keep you engaged. So thank you guys so much for Mm -hmm. watching. This has been a red eye podcast. And uh, if you're watching the YouTube version, make sure you drop a like comment, subscribe, all that stuff. If you're watching on any other platform, please drop that five star rating, share it for me. It definitely helps the podcast grow and we will check you in the next episode. Peace. Peace. Air horns. (laughs) (laughs) Appreciate it.